All right, you can take your seats. Thank you. Hey, um, I'm actually super excited to be here with, uh, with you guys and um, I've had the pleasure of connecting with, with Pastor Neil and Grace and some of the team uh, over our, in our location in Numa. And it's just been awesome to see you leaning into this space of evangelism. And as an evangelist, uh, that's, that's my heart, that's my desire that all men would come to know him. And to see you leaning in and pressing into this space, it just excites me. Because I feel across the body of Christ right now, one of the things that the Lord is doing is bringing attention back to the purpose of the gospel not just to be a consumer of it but to be a deliverer and a contributor to the world with the good news of the gospel so I'm super excited to share with you that and uh, some of you will know me because you've seen my face on a screen and you might feel like you know me more than most people would do if I walked into a room where no one knew me. It's a bit weird walking into a room where people have seen your face. Um, but I, I just want to give you a short introduction to who I am. Uh, my, my, my upbringing has been that I've been brought up in a Christian home um, uh, from actually miracle birth conception. My parents prayed for me uh, to, to be conceived and I think that's part of the reason why there's a, there's a gift and a grace and anointing on that. Um, my parents struggled to conceive for four years. They went to a life group meeting, had an empowering encounter with the Lord, fell out in the spirit and the, my mum was pregnant five weeks later. And, uh, and so um, literally God did a miracle uh, in and through that moment and uh, they told her she couldn't conceive and then she conceived me. My mum made a promise to the Lord, if you give me a child, I'll give, you, give her back to the Lord. And uh, I came into a radical encounter with the Lord at the age of five, I had a dream. And in that dream, uh, there was a sound of a trumpet. I was in my sleep, in my dream, in a dream. And in my dream, I awoke to the sound of a trumpet and there was this sense of urgency to get outside. And so I ran from my bedroom down the hallway, through the living room, to a back door that was jammed, tried to get out, couldn't get out. Eventually, Jimmy, the door opened as a five-year-old child, ran out the back door, found my parents, my family, my sisters, uh, hovering in the clouds with Jesus and with an array of angels behind him. And I just said, wait for me, wait for me, wait for me. And he looked at me and he said, you're too late. And I was like, what do you mean I'm too late? And with this love and affection in his eyes, he looked at me with longingness and, and love and said, you're too late. And I was, I was broken at that point. I, I, I looked and, and, and literally behind me, there's a multitude of people being told the same thing. And in that moment, I woke from my dream. I ran into my mum's bedroom. I, I told my mum the dream. My mum then prayed for me right then and there. I gave my life to Jesus. And from that moment on, you could not shut me up about Jesus. That moment, something changed. I didn't know that Jesus came, lived, died and rose again. I knew that he was real. I knew that he loved me and he wanted me to be with him and he wanted everybody else to be with him also. And so from that moment on, I became the, the young girl walking around in school, walking around in kids' church, walking around in, it was crazy back then, Royal Rangers, don't even know if that exists, but it's like, I just kept walking around. You, do you know Jesus? Do you know Jesus? Do you know Jesus? Do you know Jesus? You need to know Jesus. Do you know Jesus? Do you know Jesus? You need to know Jesus. And, and literally it became the mandate of my life to tell people about Jesus. As fast forward as a 16 year old in church, in youth leadership teams and, and, and in all manner of things, just being absolutely frustrated by the church. Because I would watch new people walk through the door and then the rest of the church have their own little conversations and ignore the, first, the new person walking through the door. And they were too consumed about their five, four, no more and their gathering of a holy huddle to even consider inviting the person in to sit with them and engage with them. And it was, it was very, what I like to say, clicky. And, and as a 16 year old, it made me angry. So I was a very frustrated evangelist at the age of 16. And, uh, and the Lord just brought me in to an incredible house where, the, where the, the father of that house, the pastor of that house loved on me and showed me the father's heart and showed me how to step into the frustration, the tension that I was feeling and the grace that was on my life to equip the body of Christ to do the work of ministry. And so I went on that journey and now I'm 44, I'm living the dream. I am ministering in a local church in Melbourne that has locations across the world, believing for God to move by His Spirit. And I get the privilege to come into churches like this and, and impart and in, in excite and invite people into this space because Jesus wants you to crave what He craves. The whole purpose of the good news of the gospel is that the lost would become found. And Luke chapter 19, verse 10, finishes after the story of Zacchaeus. He's climbed the tree to see Jesus. And Jesus walks by. He's one of the four people that Jesus has an encounter with and invites to follow him. And literally what happens is Jesus looks up and says, Zacchaeus, I'm coming to your house. He goes to his house, hangs out with him. 
religious people all upset because he's hanging out with sinners. And Jesus literally says to him, you know, salvation has come to this house today. After that, after, before that moment, literally Zacchaeus has said, I'll give four times the amount. Mosaic law, abiding by it. It's not just four. It's not random number in there for the sake of four. It's a part of the Mosaic law. And he paid right back what was actually owed. And in that moment, the Lord says, salvation came to this house. And then he says, I have come to seek and to save the lost. Matt, Luke 19, verse 10. Seek. That word literally means to crave to long for, to, to desire. Most of us desired and craved coffee on the way to church today. But when was the last time we craved for a lost person to be found? I'm not talking just like the idea of that, yeah, we should lead people to the Lord and tell Jesus loves them. I'm talking when was the last time that we craved long people? Like the kind of way that you crave your coffee. You know how you get when you don't get your coffee? Or you go to that place and they tell you the coffee machine's broken and it's your favourite coffee and it's like, you need that caffeine hit. <laughs> how do you get when you don't see people saved? Do you just press on and push on in life and just be like, oh, well. Because I would suggest that that means that we're not craving what he craves. And this is the heart's desire for us today is that he would provoke in us a desire for the lost to be found. And at the age of five, that's exactly what he did to me. I'm 44 now, and I've been walking with the Lord my entire 39 years. And all I want is to see more. All I want is to see more people encounter the love of Jesus. And I believe I'm in a room where there are people here who are absolutely filled with the same conviction and the same passion. But maybe somewhere, somehow, along the lines, we've forgotten the power of our own story, which hopefully you just learned about last week. And we've actually forgotten the potency of the gospel message that we carry and we kind of move in our everyday life and actually forget that we are meant to crave lost people. Because I know about you, but I'm busy. My life is busy. And you know what? It's really hard because I work for a church. So everyone in my world saved. It's extra hard. <laughs> so I go to the gym and I go to cafes and I go to milk bars and I go to petrol stations and I, and I look for opportunities for where the glory of God can break out. Even just getting in an Uber, I'm looking for, oh, what do you want to do in this space? Just last week, I was in an Uber coming back from Perth and, and, and I felt on the Lord, there was this Muslim lady in the car and I felt in the Lord, his heart was for her, but she was like stone cold. You ever met one of those people stone cold? You're like, oh man, this conversation's hard. Like it's 4.30 in the morning and I'm like, hey, so how are you? Yep. Okay, good. Do you like this job? Do you like driving Uber? Yep. No. Nah. Hate it. Okay, I'm feeling good in this car right now. Like, I'm having one of these conversations and I'm like, Lord, I know your heart's for us. Show me an open door. Show me an entry point. We stop off. We pick up one of my other young guys who was with me on this trip. And as we come to his place, he gets in the car and I'm like, oh, this guy, he's an evangelist. He's going to get after it. He sits in the car and he's dead silent. And I'm like, well, that's going well. And I'm like, okay, Lord, what are we going <laughs> to What are we going to do? And so the Lord says to me on the way there, after she's told me she hates a job and she only does it because she needs to pay rent and she da 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 and I'm just like, and the Lord says to me, you need to give her $100. And I'm like, do I have $100? And, and the Lord's like, you need to give her $100. And I'm like, okay. He said, don't give it to her until you get out of the car. And I was like, oh, okay. There's a Metron. Anyway, that's a whole other story. But as I, as I lean into this space, I get out of the car and I get the bags out the back. She comes out the back and I just said to her, hey, listen, the Lord spoke to me and he told me to give you this. Jesus wants you to know that he loves you. So I use God first because with the Muslim, it's always good for an entry point. Acknowledge God. Jesus wants you to know that he loves you. He knows you by name and he knows your need and he wants to meet that today. And you saw her, she's welled up with tears in her eyes and she was like, thank you, thank you, thank you. And then I prayed for her and I prayed the sinner's prayer over her life. <laughs> And I said, Jesus, reach into her world today and tell her that you love her. Because we're, we're, we're always meant to be on mission. Yeah? Yes. We're a church. We're on mission. Yes. Uh, and, and can I just say this? A church with a missions department is ineffective. Because it means that you've delegated responsibility of mission to that group of people. Mission is everybody's responsibility. It's a lifestyle of a believer. If you love him, you love what he loves and he loves others and he wants them to know him. Is that cool? Ooh, we're just getting started.
Come on. All right. So following on from Luke chapter 19, verse 10, we're going to roll into Luke 19, 11 through to 23. And I want to suggest this. Paul, the man himself, I love him. He's the writer of a number of the epistles in the Bible. But he actually says this in Romans chapter 10, verse 1. He says, My heart's desire and prayer to God is for them, the people that he's trying to reach, the Gentiles, is that they may be saved. I want to suggest to us today that every believer has a responsibility to share Jesus confidently. Every believer must be in a place where they have a desire for other people to be saved. But often our prayer times are prayer lists before the Lord. Lord, could you help me with this? Could you do it with my kids? Could you do, it? Could you do this with my business? Could you do this with my marriage? Could you? And they become a prayer list of consumer-driven things. But the desire of the Father's heart is that we would commune with Him and ask Him for His heart, that He would give that to us and that we would reach lost people. See, the thing is, is that when, John, when Jesus said this in Luke 19.10, He said, I came to seek and save the lost. He was actually saying that to the religious people who were listening and to the disciples that were with Him. And He's trying to make His mission quite clear. He leans into another story leading on in verse 11. Now, it's not a, um, that's one story and here's a new story three years later. This is a rolling on story. He literally says at the start of this passage that because of those who were gathered, they thought that He was going to usher in the kingdom of God there and there then that's what they were looking for that's what they wanted and so he speaks this parable to them now it is the parable of the minna it is not the parable of the talents so two different stories parable of the talents is each one's given according to their ability parable of the minna each one is given one minna each are you familiar with this story awesome it says this It says in verse 11, as they heard these things, he proceeded to tell a parable because he was near to Jerusalem. And they supposed because that the kingdom of God was to appear immediately, he said, therefore, okay, because of that, he said this. Now, the story that he paints to them is that he is a master bringing in 10 servants and he says to them, I'm about to go away, so I'm going to give each one of you a minna. There's 10 of them. They give him a minna and he says, I want you to engage in business until I come. Now, the picture of this for us to understand today is that that is each believer being given the gospel, everyone being given the same thing, equal playing field. Can't complain. He didn't get 10 and you got five. You all got one. And the Lord looks to this situation. He says, I want you to engage in business until I come. I'm leaving. He's painting the picture of his departure and the resurrection but that he would actually return. And what he's looking for is what did you do with to gain a return when he returns? This passage is, 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 is such a clear picture of the father's business and the entrustment of his business to you and I. Now in this passage, as we go on, there are three people who return. There were 10 and then there were three. Out of the three, the first one comes back and says, as the... As the, as the um, as the master returns, he looks for what, he's, what has been multiplied and he calls them back in, three return, and he says, I have done what you've asked me to do, here's 10 in return. The father, Jesus looks at him and the master, the story, and just says, yep, well done, good and faithful servant, here's 10 cities. Then it goes on and says the next one comes in and he brings back five. So he took his one, turned it into five. The master looks at him and says, yep, well done, give him five cities. Then it goes on and the next one comes in and it says that he says, Lord, I knew that you were a harsh master and therefore I took what you gave to me and I put it in a hanky and I put it in my pocket and I waited to your return. He pulls out the hanky and says, here's what you gave to me. The master looks at him and says to him, you knew me to be a hard hard servant, a hard master, then why didn't you put it into a bank? At least it could have earned interest. Then he says to the servants around him, take that one from him and give it to the one who has 10. Their response is, he's got 10 already. Why would you want to give him another one? (laughs) And the Lord says, he's trustworthy with little, will be trustworthy with a lot. Even what he has will be added to, but what he has will be taken from him. And he literally says to the one, take what is given to him and give to somebody else. And then he says to the seven that did not return, check this out, harsh story, but in the Bible. It says this, I tell you that everyone who has more will be given more, but from the one, even, uh, the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away from him. But as for these enemies of mine, 
who did not want me to reign over them, bring them here and slaughter them before me. Ooh. Poke the person next to you and tell them that's heavy for a Sunday. The reality is we've all been entrusted the gospel and Jesus will return. And on his return, he's looking to see what you and I have done with that which he gave to us. My question to us today is which which servant do we relate to? Because most often I think we find ourselves in a position where we're confronted with the reality of, oh, that's right, I have a responsibility. And often what happens in the busyness of our life is that we find ourselves so busy about what we're doing that we forget that there even is a kingdom and that there even is a king and that he's asked us to do anything. And and often what I find in my own life is that if it's not on the forefront of my mind, if it's not in my prayer world and if it's not on, on my heart, then more often than not, there's not many people getting saved around me. And I don't believe that we're just called to stand on platforms and just preach the gospel and and watch those come to the Lord through that. Although that is a good thing, hear my heart, I would much prefer to see a church have more soul winning on the outside of the four walls than it has on the inside of the four walls. Because to me, it's reflective of every believer sharing Jesus confidently and stewarding what they have been given. So, the 10 servants are called in. I want you to understand this, that that word servant in the Greek, is actually the same word found in Galatians chapter 4, verses 4 through to 7. The, say, the word means slave. It's doulos in the Greek. And just for the sake of it, if you've got a Bible, feel free to open up and head over. Galatians. I love a paper Bible. Galatians chapter 4, verses 4 through to 7, it says, But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his Son, born of a woman under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, so that he might receive, so that we might receive adoption as sons. But as you are sons, God has sent forth the Spirit of his Son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father, so that you are no longer a slave, but a Son, And if a son, then an heir through God. Can I tell you this this morning? The good news is this. You don't have a master looking to drive you. You have a father looking to impart to you his heart for his business. We're not working for a master with a minna. We're, we're working for a father with the father's business of seeing the lost saved. And he calls you no longer a slave, but he calls you a son. Ever hate being told what to do when you're a kid? Maybe you hate being told what to do now as an adult. (laughs) When the Lord comes before you today, he doesn't come to you as 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 a master being like, he comes to you being like a father saying, hey, my heart's breaking. And you're a son about the father's business. What is the father's business? The father's business is this. There are lost sons and daughters that need to be found. They're not lost random strangers. They're not the crazy person that you walked the opposite side of the road to avoid. Random. They're brothers and sisters in Christ. The only difference between you and them is that they're lost and you're found. And what we have is the extension of the Father's heart to reach into their worlds and say, Jesus loves you, has a purpose and a plan for your life. This is how he changed my life. Can I introduce you to him? Have you ever considered you giving your life to Jesus? And would you ever do it? Would you like to now? Huh. It's, it's, it's ridiculously simple, but yet so profound. And the beauty of this is that Jesus himself was not looking for a striving servant. He was looking for a faithful servant. Because when the man came back with 10, he said, well done, good faithful. Not striving. Have you ever met a constipated Christian? (laughs) They're really awkward people to be around. They're always like, oh, Lord. Like, sorry, that might have been a bit graphic. Um, (laughs) just intensity <laughs> but the Jesus I read he, he's got an intense message but he's filled with love joy peace he, he has this joy about him where sinners actually want to hang out with him like 
We're not meant to be out there yelling at every single person. You sinner, you're going to hell. You need to. No, 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 no. We need. To, we need to come with joy and love and hope and and bring the Father's heart, not a master with a slave, but a Father's heart to a son or to a daughter who needs to be found. That's his desire. That's his desire is that we would seek and save the lost. We would seek and crave the lost like he does. And I love this because, you know, I was, I got a nephew, I got a family, I come from a Christian family, I think I'm like, we worked out fifth or sixth generation Christian family going back. It was all Methodist back in the day, but Jesus is the foundation, yeah. And, and, and as, as a result, my, my generations previously to me, my great nana used to pray for the great, great grandchildren, the great grandchildren and the grandchildren and the children like she they prayed for each generation and so my nan who is 97 god bless her she um she only died last year in perth uh, in in melbourne while i was in perth and i got a phone call to say that she was passing away and i was like okay everyone's got a time to go she's 97 and i said i was disappointed because i was in perth i wanted to be there and uh, i said to her nan look i'm praying that you would you would survive the weekend so that i could come and visit you but if you don't i'll see you in heaven how pleasant is the death of his saints in his eyes? <laughs> You're a good woman. I love you and thank you for praying for me because she prays for every generation and she passed that on to the next grandma, the next, and it goes on. But as I prayed for her on the phone, huh, she just had a, um, she had a fall. She had a bleed on the brain. She'd fractured her spine. She couldn't move. And as a result of the bleed on the brain, she couldn't talk. She lost her speech. And they said that she would be dead the next morning. And uh, I got a phone call the next day to say, hey, well, look, here's a surprise. Uh, Nan is up walking around. She is telling everybody about the good news of the gospel. Ha. I got a video on my phone of her when I went back to visit her on the Monday. I flew back in Monday, drove straight to the country, went and saw her, and I said, Nan... I'm so glad because we still didn't know. The doctors kept saying she's still going to die. She's got a brain bleed. She'll still pass away. She's still here today. That was October last year. We went out here in August. She's still kicking. But I got a video over on my phone and this is what she says. She said, I believe that the Lord has preserved my life so that I can tell more people about Jesus. She made it her mission and her mandate to get around to that whole retirement village and walk around to every room and lead people to Jesus. And one by one, they started falling like ducks as far as like death coming to their door and then they were saved beforehand and my nan is rejoicing because she was one who could bring the gospel. Ha. My nan, she prays for every generation and now my mom, she's a grandmother and now she's praying for the next generation, the generations to come. And I got a nephew, he's 18, he uh, brought up in a Christian home, parents are pastors, he's gone like the wayward son, he's done a, he's done a prodigal on us and uh, it's heartbreaking and it's hard to watch and I'm an overly invested auntie, I don't have children, I'm not married and uh, I don't have any kids, I've had a few foster kids but my nephews and nieces are, and my foster kids have been like my kids, I've, I've treated them like they're my own, that God's gift to me to, to steward and, and I have loved them and my nephew has uh, blatantly walked away from the Lord, he has chosen a lifestyle that is contrary to everything our family has known, he's the first one out of the generations to do so and uh, my mom and my nan have just gone to prayer going after it like just no you are a child of God you've been brought up in this house you will you've been trained in the ways of the Lord you will come to know Jesus and so there's like a lot of prayer and intercession going on for him and uh, I can honestly say to you he's come to my house had encounters had conversations shared with him there's been darkness broken off his life and he's he's just there's just edging slightly ever so slowly painfully over the last three or four years getting getting closer and uh, we're believing for his salvation but you know the way I pray for him the way you pray for your lost brothers and sisters and family, it's pretty different to how we pray for Joe across the road. Because we treat them like they're randoms, but they're actually lost brothers and sisters. And the way my grandmother prays, the way my mother prays, the way I pray, and the way his mother prays for my nephew's salvation, man, if only... A generation would pray like that <laughs> for a generation that doesn't know him. His desire is that all men would know him, that none would perish without him. 
And I, I honestly believe that the Lord is stirring and provoking you as a church in this season to lean into this space. But he says, I don't want you to see yourself as a slave. I want you to see yourself as a son. I want you to see yourself as a son. And some of us are here today and some of us are scared to share our faith, dealing with issues of fear. Some of us have just worked out that we actually have to share our faith and you're like, well, I never knew why we had to share our faith. And some of you are here today and you're like, I actually don't know how to share my faith. And then there are others who are here today and you've seen people step in and worship God and you're hearing about a Jesus who loves, but you actually don't know him and you may need to respond to Jesus today. The reality is this. Jesus came on this earth to pay a price that you and I couldn't pray, pay. The Bible says that the wages of sin is death and death had to be paid for the sin that mankind had committed. Jesus came, he lived, he died, and he rose again to pay that price, to have victory over death, to have victory over sin, so that you could be ushered in back into right relationship with your father, that he could love you, that you could love him, and that you could love others. That's the desire of the father's heart, is that you would know him. Not just as an out there, crutch, idea, worldly kind of concept of like churches, you know, just a crutch. No, 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 no. This is the creator of heaven and earth who created you for relationship with him. And he wants you to know him, your creator, the one who gave you purpose, the one who led your life so that you could know him. And I think, hmm, Paul sums it up like this. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 12, he says, We endure anything rather than put an obstacle in the way of the gospel. And the question for us today is, do we hinder the gospel or do we honour the gospel? Honour means to esteem, to value, and to respect. Hmm. Well, sometimes what I find is that I received the gospel back then and now I do church. Hmm. Now we do church. We check in and we check out. And you know what we've done? We've made the church, the Sunday service gathering, a place that is meant to be the upper room. We all love the upper room, right? We all love the glory. We all love the presence of God. We love it. But the upper room was never actually meant to be designed to contain God's glory. It was meant to be a place that He could come upon His people and that His glory could trickle out across the ends of the earth. Do we hinder the gospel? Are we an obstacle for people coming to faith in Christ because we're too busy, too caught up? Or because we've turned the Sunday service into an upper room where we have turned it into a container of God's glory where we check in and check out and come back and we've turned it into a form of escapism from the world? Because unfortunately, it's much easier to be in here and enjoy the comfort of family and Christians and love one another and give for one another, care for one another and all the things that come as a part of the body of Christ, the community. But has, has it become our escape? Or has it become the place where we encounter the glory of God and we're so filled up with Him that when we leave, we become a vessel of glory out there? And that when we come back in, we're empty of glory to receive more glory, to go out and bring more glory. This is the desire of God. The upper room was never just about a holy huddle, a shunda hunda moment, a tickle me elmo moment. It was actually about the glory of God being dispensed on mankind and mankind becoming the vessels that He could use to take the gospel to the ends of the earth. Have you ever considered the reality that we're only here because 12 men actually got this? Well, actually 11, because number 12, he fell off and got someone to fulfill his role. <laughs> but have you ever considered that fact? You're only here because someone shared the gospel with you. 
his desire is that you would not just hold that information, but that you would share that with somebody else. So as a team are back, if I could ask if you could stand with me. I honestly feel like the Lord wants to do something in our hearts today. And for some of us, that's going to look like repentance. Some of that's going to look like us responding. For some of us, it's, 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 it's going to be a prayer that's like, God, break my heart for what breaks yours. And help me to crave what you crave, to desire what you desire. And there's not one person in the room that's disqualified from this. Even myself and us as leaders in the house of God, like we can get so busy and so preoccupied with the schedule, the calendar and the things that have got to go on that we actually forget that when we walk through a supermarket, the person next to us is going to hell. That they don't know Jesus. We forget that, that the person who dropped you off to the airport or the Uber that took you to work, or, do they know Jesus? See, this is what happens, I find, in churches that we, 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 we get saved and we, we hit our networks. We hit our friends. We hit our family. And so we may get rejected. So we, we go to the place of prayer. We continue to press in and we may get some saved, but we're still pressing in for some of those places. But we, we lose the, the expectation, the anticipation and the desire because it's kind of like, well, we just, we just got to take our time with it. And there's a place for that. But what I find is, is we're kind of like, to be honest, we're kind of like the gym that, that, that capped at its network of people. And we've got to do something more. And there's something more of the Lord for us is that we would take the gospel and share it with anyone who is willing to listen. Crazy concept. 1901, they did a census in Australia. And on the census, they asked a question about their religion. And 0.01% said that they didn't have a faith. In 2016, over 100 years later, one generation later, maybe two dependent on age. Hmm. They did the census, the same questions asked, and 30% of people indicated that they had no religion. There's just under a third of the whole of a nation of Australia out there that actually doesn't even know that Jesus exists. When Jesus said that the harvest is ripe, He's on it. He was on it back then, and He's on it today. He just said the labourers are few. Labourers are workers. Labourers are the ones who are about the Father's business. Last time I checked into a form of labouring, it meant hard work. Some of us, these days today, people, I don't even know what think people think they know what work is. Like, what do you do for work? Yeah, I sit on a computer and I do, and I'm like, wow, okay back in my day. Um, <laughs> labour means work. Just ask a woman who's been in labour. Ask her how much hard work that was. All right? It means hard work. I believe the call, Lord, the call of the Lord today for us is that He's calling us to do the hard work. And you know what the benefits of that are? You're part of the Father's business expanding His kingdom. You're a part of seeing lost brothers and sisters found. You're a part of seeing lives restored, made whole, healed, delivered, set free. You're a part of something that's bigger than yourself. Huh. The beauty of this is it's like it's one of the benefits of being a part of his, his business is that we actually have the privilege of leading people to Jesus. It's actually quite contagious when you start. You lead one and you're like, oh my gosh, that was awesome. That was unbelievable. I feel so, that's amazing. And you want to go do it again. <laughs> I was talking to a pastor just last week who had a massive encounter with God through a, a meeting over in Perth at Ben Fitzgerald was preaching and read one passage from 1 Corinthians and said, how can you love him if you don't love what he loves? Charles Spurgeon puts it like this. If you have no desire for anyone else to be saved, are you yourself even saved? Because how can you love Him 
and not love what He loves. Mm, confronting. I was talking to her and she said, in my 38 years of being a Christian, I've, I, can le- I can tell you honestly on one hand how many people I've led to the Lord. She said, but something shifted, something changed on the inside of me. All of a sudden there's been something that's awoken and now all I want to do is tell people about Jesus. I want to see fear broken off my life. I want to step out of my comfort zone. I want to, and she starts speaking on a whole nother tangent and has recently had the privilege of leading someone to the Lord. And now she's on fire. Now she can't shut up. (laughs) Who wants that? Ah, come on. Jesus. Lord, I thank you for every arm raised right across this room right now. Lord, we are your children and we hear your call for your business. We thank you, Lord, that the Father's business is seeking and saving the lost. And Lord, we commit ourselves as children of God to seek and save the lost. I'm praying, Holy Spirit, that you would come right now in this moment, like you did in the upper room. You would descend on this room. Let the glory of God break out in our hearts and lives and so catapult our heart and desire towards your affection, not our own affection but towards Your affection. Lord, I ask that You would shift our mindsets from it being about the special few that have that gift and grace to it being about every believer sharing Jesus confidently. Lord, I'm asking, would You come right now and in our minds where we struggle with the idea of sharing our faith, would You change our mindsets? God, would You break fear off people's lives right now in Jesus' Name. I pray against the spirit of fear right now. I command You to lift off people's lives in Jesus' Name. I break the fear of rejection. I break the fear of man. I break the fear of that you will fail. And I break the fear that you would just somehow mess it up with what you've got to say. I thank you that the Spirit of God comes upon His people to fill them with words to speak and the gifts of the Spirit to bring the revelation of who Jesus is. And so I pray right now for a release of heaven across this room. Glory of God, come. Holy Spirit, fill this place. Fill your people with power. Fill them with boldness. Fill them with the glory of God to be dispensers of glory. In the mighty name of Jesus, I ask right now, God, would you break our hearts for what breaks yours? And Jesus, may it be when we get asked the question, when was the last time we longed for someone to know the Lord? When was the last time we led someone to the Lord? We could say just last week, just yesterday. Hmm. That, Lord, this house would be filled with more water baptisms than it would be decisions. That, God, there would be more souls, one on the outside of the four walls, than there would be in the inside of the four walls in an altar call. Jesus, we long to see you glorified and lifted high across this earth. And for the name of Jesus to be known, that every man would bow and every knee would, would bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Jesus. Paul. He's here right now. And He's wanting to minister. He's wanting to to lead you in this space. And I think there's a a desire for us to, to respond to the Lord's call today. You know, the beauty of this is that when Jesus called people to follow Himself, He just said, come follow me. And if they didn't follow, He didn't chase. The rich young ruler, He told him what he needed to do. He couldn't do it. Jesus never chased him down and said, oh, if you just do half of that, if you just do, no, he just, he literally just walked on. And I feel like the Lord would say to us today, he's here. And if you're willing to respond today, he will break off fear off your life. He will actually set you up to have conversations with people this week. And that you would lead people to the Lord in ways that you actually never thought was possible. If you would respond. And so the response is this today. Maybe you're here. And you're like, I just found out that it's my responsibility. That I'm actually employed by the Father of Heaven for this role. And you want to step into the fullness of that. I'm going to ask you to come down to my left, your, your right, but down to the very, very left, very right. And some of our team are going to meet with you and just pray, pray for you and lay hands on you. Because there's gifts and graces on them for evangelism. And, and I believe it's going to unlock something in you as you step into that newness of that reality today. And then there's this. I feel like today that there are people here that you've had um, a fear because you don't know how to share the gospel. And the Lord actually wants to break that off your life today. And as you respond to Him calling out to you today and follow Him, it's going to break. It's going to break off your life. 
and He's gonna show you how to share. And if you're doing sharing Jesus confidently, you're halfway there. <laughs> it's so easy, it's ridiculous. We overcomplicate it. But if that's you, I just want you to come down here and gather in this center section of the altar here. And then there's those who are here today and you know that you have the gift and grace of an evangelist and you've been a frustrated evangelist in the church. You've been mad at the church because the church isn't winning people and you're actually frustrated and you keep coming to church but you're annoyed because you just want to see people get saved and you want to see more get saved. And if that's you, I just want you to gather down here on my right on your left. And I believe that today there is going to be such an unlocking across this auditorium as we worship and as we lift up the name of the Father, as we pray for people, as we lay hands on people. There's an impartation in the laying on of hands and something is going to break today because Jesus designed this church to be a house that would be full, not just for one service or two services a day, but for over five or six services a day filled with people knowing Jesus, being discipled and being restored to the Father. So come on, why don't you begin to cry out to Him? Because it's He who's going to bring deliverance. It's He who's going to set you free. It's He who's going to impart gifts. It's He who's going to impart the grace. So Lord, I thank You right now for every single person that's responded to Your call today. And I'm asking Jesus, would You come and do what You said You would do? Lord, would You set those up who have never realised it was their responsibility to share the Gospel? Would You set them up with encounters this week? Lord, I pray for those who have fear, those who have felt like they don't know how to share the Gospel. I pray, God, would You come and reveal Yourself to them and may they live by the Spirit, keep in step with the Spirit and Lord as they live and led by the Spirit that they would reach encounter after encounter where they could lead people to the Lord and Lord I pray right now for an outpouring upon the evangelists that Lord God you would set them up to show them how to teach others to share the good news of the Gospel, that Lord you would cause them to be more fruitful and that the Kingdom of God would be open and displayed with power and with authority in the mighty name of Jesus.